What's going on, everybody? Welcome to the SBNR podcast. I'm Jack, otherwise known as MLB Nerds on Instagram, and I'm here with my friend Ryan Garcia, otherwise known as Ryan Garcia ESM on Twitter. Today, we're going to be talking about a few things, uh, one being free agency, the George Springer signing, the Michael Brantley signing, the Jerkson Profar signing, and the Kike Hernandez signing, uh, with a bunch of other signings, because there have been uh, plenty recently. We'll also be talking about uh, general baseball analytics in our podcast, as well as prediction for the season, though that might come in a later podcast. We'll also be talking uh, about Twitter, because we're all very active users on Twitter for our ratios of the week. And we'll explain more about what a ratio is when we get to that topic. Additionally, we'll be talking about uh, standing predictions as well with uh, teams like the Blue Jays, who are going to be a fringe playoff team potentially. The Astros will be an interesting team in the playoffs. And uh, the pitching market for the Yankees in particular, but there are many other teams that will be looking for pitchers. So with all in mind, let's get into it. As there's a drive in a deep left field by Castellanos, it will be a home run. Our first talking point of the day is going to be about uh, all-star and uh, MVP candidate George Springer of the formerly the Houston Astros signing with the Toronto Blue Jays on a six-year, $150 million deal. Ryan, what, are your, what were your initial thoughts on the signing, and what are your thoughts now? If they're not the same, then say they're not the same, but if they are pretty similar, then just let us know. Well, I mean, honest to God, I feel like this is like probably the best. I think this was actually – the best free agent on the market and the blue jays got him at a pretty good price at 25 million a year i know it's six years but like we're talking about someone who's a perennial mvp candidate and at, in terms of position players probably a top 10 position player in baseball he has a 138 weighted runs creative plus over the last three years with eight outs above average like this is like perfect this is perfect for the blue jays like i, I couldn't think of a better free agent for them to sign because there isn't a better free agent on the mar- market even when the free agents even when free agency started yeah, I'm going to have to sort of agree with you. I think they could probably get a better free agent, and they still can. You know, guys like James Paxton are out there, guys in the trade market, which we'll talk about a bit later. But uh, Springer's an incredible signing for the Blue Jays. Obviously, their biggest hole at this point is going to be pitching, given that they only have ERA Merchant, a.k.a. Ryu, uh, as pretty much their ace. And then after that, they have Nate Pearson, who projects to be very good, but uh, is a bit unproven if they're going to make a playoff push going forward. It's unlikely that he'll be a good enough number two for next season. So uh, I think we'll see going forward how they do with the pitching. They signed, uh, excuse me, starting pitching. They signed uh, Tyler Chatwood, who was more of a depth pickup than anything. But I think the Blue Jays need to get one more arm to be a legitimate uh, contender for a wild card at this point. That arm could be Canadian James Paxson. Uh, it could be potentially Jamison Tyon. It could be even maybe Herman Marquez, depending on where they want to go with that. There are plenty of options. And I think the Blue Jays are going to make one more move. If Jamison Town is a Blue Jay, I will cry on the podcast. Like I, I, I will I, also I, cry. Yeah, I, at this point, I can't deal with the pain of losing Tyon well, as my, well. But my fucking Instagram ad is Jamison Tyon to NYY, so I'll cry more. Don't worry. I mean, I but I also think people are overreacting to, to the Springer signing. Like the Blue Jays are not the best team; they're the third best team in the division, yeah. arguably the fourth best team in that division. I do not think that they are going to win the division with just this roster. Like people think the Yankees' pitching problems are bad. Like they, they actually have really bad pitching problems. They do have uh, Ryu there, who I think is a good starter, but everyone else there is either Pearson, who can't really pitch. At, he hasn't ever pitched. More, I think I don't think he's pitched a lot of innings in the uh, professional level. So how do you know he's going to pitch over a full season? How do you know he's not going to have an innings limit? And then everyone else there is a bunch of question marks slash mediocre starters who aren't going to do anything really. So they're not, I don't think they're division contenders yet. And I don't think they're even, they're better than the Rays. I think it's crazy to think they're better than the Rays right now. I agree with you. Uh, Staying on the topic of the Toronto Blue Jays, they were also able to sign Kirby Yates to a one-year $5 million contract. They can get up to $8 million in incentives. Um, I personally, I just want to start with this one. I think this is going to be an incredible deal for the Blue Jays. By the end of the day, I still agree with you with the fact that they're probably a third or fourth place, fourth place team at best. But Yates is a top three closer when healthy when he has all his stuff. Uh, and I'm, I'm really shocked that a guy like Liam Hendricks, who I think Yates is actually better than, but a guy like Liam Hendricks got three, okay. four years, whatever his fucking kind. It's just really confusing. Um, but it, you got like the cumulatively, no matter what, it's going to be three to four years or and $54 million. Yates gets one year for five, and I understand Yates is a lot older, and he probably wasn't going to get a multi-year deal just because he's coming off somewhat of a down year because he was injured, 
though um, I definitely think this is a good signing for the Blue Jays. I uh, just for a reliever in general, I don't really believe in paying relievers more than ten million dollars, especially three to four years. I think this is an incredible pickup for the Blue Jays and Yates, and I think you could argue that it'll make more of an impact than potentially a guy like Springer um, in terms of cost uh, effectiveness. Well, I certainly agree with you on on the whole concept of I think it's extremely stupid to pay relievers more than ten million AAV. Like Yates at five mil, so at, at, if he sucks, he's going to be five million dollars, yep. right? If he's good, he's going to be what eight point two five. Yeah, percent? and it's in it's I don't eight point. Eight uh, eight he's going to be five point five is the base salary. I messed that up. I'm sorry. It can get up to eight, and you know it might not. Obviously, I'm not entirely sure what the incentives are. But say he's the best reliever in baseball, he leads in saves, probably gets the All Star team. He'll probably get to like eight. I mean, the word like he's one, he's what one year removed or one sixty game season removed from being the second or first best reliever in the sport. I mean, in twenty nineteen at two point oh five skill interactive ERA. I mean, I personally think this is an example of competent ownership and G and competent GMs versus incompetent GMs. Competent GMs go out and and they pick up a guy like Kirby Yates for one year five million, and they don't spend fifty four million dollars on a relief pitcher. That's the difference between a really good front office and a really poor front office. Look at what the Dodgers did. The Dodgers last year, they got gave a cheap contract to Jake, Jake McGee and a cheap contract to Blake Trinan. And those two became extremely important pitchers in their playoff run. And they didn't go out and they didn't spend $20 million uh, on a reliever. They went out and spent like, uh, they went out and spent like what? 5 million, I think on McGee and like 7 million on Trinan. It was, it was cheap. And when you deal with relievers, you always go cheaper on relievers because they're extremely volatile and they're usually one of the least valuable positions individually on your team. I have to agree with you fully on that. Uh, I think our points are incredibly similar. Um, I personally yeah. have Yates at number, I think it was two or three when I did make my, my rankings. Uh, for those of you coming from MLB nerds, you've seen them likely. You've probably leave the mean, left a mean comment on them. Either way, uh, <laughs> same. Either way, I have Yates definitely top three. Uh, even if he's like fifty percent, maybe eighty percent of the pitcher he was before, he's still going to be good. He'll definitely be worth it. The Houston Astros were able to sign Michael Brantley or re-sign Michael Brantley to a two-year, thirty-two million dollar contract. Uh, this was directly after several reporters, even the big guys, Jeff Hassan, Jeff Passan, however the fuck you say his name. Ken Rosenthal, John Heyman and company all said he was going to the Blue Jays on a three-year contract. Um, as for the Astros, they were able to get, able to get Brantley back on a 16-year uh, average annual value contract over two years, which is pretty similar to what his initial contract was with Houston, though uh, I believe he got a slight raise. Ryan, what are your thoughts or what were your initial thoughts on Brantley potentially going to the Blue Jays? And then when you realized he was going back to Houston, what were your thoughts on the signing of him going right back? Well, I mean, personally speaking, uh, I really liked Brantley on the market. I was a believer in if the Yankees were going to go out and trade Brett Frazier, I really wanted Brantley. That was my guy, right? Because, I mean, offensively, he's at a 130 weighted runs created plus, 368 Woba, all that. I mean, not 368 on base, all that good stuff. And Astros, they get him back on a 16, 16 uh, million dollars a year. And I think the Blue Jays missed out on an opportunity to have one of the top lineups in baseball. They If they would have brought in Brantley, we're talking about, you know, one of the better lineups of baseball. And then at that point, you can get into the discussion of, okay, if they get pitching, are they a threat for the division? And I think they kind of they, they kind of threw that in the trash by failing to bring him in. Because did, I know he wanted to go to the Blue Jays because of Springer, and they kind of botched that entire situation. So, you know, I think they botched that. I'm going to have to disagree with you on that. I think it was actually for the better that the Blue Jays missed out on Brantley as their outfields are already pretty much stacked. And yeah, I know Gurley has played shortstop in the past. He was an incredibly shady defender over there. Either way, I think they're better off going for a guy like potentially Colton Wong or even Justin Turner, though. I think Wong's a bit more realistic. Plugging Wong over at second, playing Biggio at third for a season. And then when Austin Martin, their highly tied prospect, comes up, he moves to shortstop. Bichette moves over to third. The reason I think this is because Brantley, uh, he was what? $16 million annual uh, value for the Astros. And uh, at the yeah. end of the day, I think the Blue Jays are much better off spending that on someone like James Paxton or another pitcher, really, because at this point, their lineups are already pretty good. Like I said, I don't think it's really a top five lineup in baseball, but I don't think it's in the top 10 range, especially with the potential progression of Vladimir Guerrero Jr., Boba Shett and company, because their team is so young and so talented. 
So, I actually am going to have to disagree with you on the fact that I, I I think it was definitely probably for the better, like I said, that they missed out on him. Well, I mean, you could make the argument, though, like, okay, for Paxton, right? Is Paxton, how do we know his health is fine? We saw him at the showcase. It was like 94 he was topping out at. Like, there's no, he's not a surefire thing. I think he's a good signing for, like, a risk. But does do you go, okay, Ryu, and then question mark on Paxton, that's a good enough rotation to get to the playoffs without Brantley. No, I don't think well, that, I don't even think I don't think that's good enough to get to playoffs. And you can make a trade. Like if you get Brantley, you're in a situation where you now have to make a trade. You can go out and get a pretty good pitcher. Like if they were to go out and get Brantley, bring in Tyone, and then you could probably still sign a you could still probably sign a Paxton at that point. You would have Ryu, Paxton, Tyone, Brantley Springer, uh Brantley Springer, Kavon Biggio, Bichette. Uh, Vlad Guerrero Jr., all those guys in there, Teoscar Hernandez, uh, Guriel, you'd have all those bats in there. You'd, argue, you'd probably be at that point a solidified playoff team with a very good chance to upset uh, the Rays or Yankees for the division. At the end of the day, though, Paxton would probably get a one-year contract. And uh, looking for the future, I don't think a guy like Brantley on a one-year deal would really suit, the, uh, it would suit them the best, which is really my main thing with the Brantley thing. I don't necessarily think that um, – I think Brantley is still a great player. I just – I question the fit with Toronto just because of their cap space situation. Uh, sorry, not cap space. Well, yeah, cap space situation before they hit the luxury tax and the fact that they're, they just lack so much pitching. I mean, I still think they could have gotten pitching, even if they got um, – even if they got Brantley. Because right now they only have uh, $78 million on the total payroll. They're the 18th highest uh, payroll in the league. So I, I know they probably would hit around $100 million at most. Um, and Brantley does hinder that. But you can still trade for starting pitching. like that. Put They totally have the farm system to go out and trade for a guy like Luis Castillo if they wanted to. Or, I know, or um, you know, if they want to go crazy, they can go get um, Herman Marquez. Maybe they go out and get a guy like Tyone. They can 100% make any move they want to make for a starting pitcher in the trade market. And I think that a guy like Luis Castillo... For them, it's better than an investment on Bauer, and it's better on than on an investment on Paxton in terms of immediate impact, at least for the Paxton front. And I don't trust Bauer to be consistent and be uh, worth the contract he's probably going to get. So I don't think the, the Blue Jays benefit from signing any starting pitchers over trading for one. I understand what you're saying, though I, I still disagree because uh, I think they're just better off going for a one-year rental third baseman or second baseman. Uh, moving on. Uh, past this whole um, Astros Brentley thing and Blue Jays Brentley thing, uh, we're going to talk about Joe Musgrove, uh, formerly of the Pittsburgh Pirates, and in Ryan's mind, the New York Yankees, and is a San Diego Padre at this point. At the end of the day, uh, I know it's going to hurt you, Ryan, talking about this. I think my initial reaction to this trade was that the Padres, I didn't really understand what the Padres were doing just because they already have so much pitching depth, and their really biggest and bigger need at this point, I'd say, is bullpen, even though it's pretty good. And potentially, you could argue their lineup could use another bat, like a Jock Peterson, potentially. Uh, but I thought of it more, and Joe Musgrove, at the end of the day, they're probably a bit concerned with Lamette's health, or they don't want Gore up right away. So right now, their projected rotation is looking like uh, Blake Snell, Yu Darvitt, if healthy, Denelson Lamette, uh, Joe Musgrove, and um, who am I forgetting? Uh, is it Paddock? Is that the last Chris guy? Paddock, yes. Chris Paddock with Mike Clevenger coming back Clevenger next year. Can't pitch. Yeah, he's coming back next year, uh, and McKenzie Gore in the farm system. They also have a plethora of guys, options like Ryan Weathers, Adrian Morahone, and they've indicated they're, they're going to go with a six-man rotation. Uh, so that's going to be interesting to see how that plays out with guys like Blake Snell. Maybe he'll be able to go longer into innings. I'm sorry, longer, more innings into games, longer into games. So it'll be interesting to see how they handle Snell and the innings with all the starting pitchers. Uh, Ryan, your thoughts? Um, personally, in my opinion, I think that the Padres hate me and baseball. Um, because what was the point? Like, why did they have, they didn't have to do that, right? They didn't have to, you know, go out and trade for Joe Musgrove, but they just hate baseball and hate happiness. You see, they understand that I would have been a happier person, but bias aside, I think the trade, I agree with you on the front that it was kind of a pointless use of assets. You could have gone out and probably traded for someone to help your bullpen or at least if you're going to trade for Musgrove you could have gotten Richard Rodriguez in that deal and at least got a a starter and a reliever so it just feels like a really weird uh use of assets because if you're going to turn one of these starters and reliever at that point why don't you just go out and get a reliever 
You invested a lot of assets into your rotation. Um, I question the uh, depth in your uh, first at your first base position and in the outfield with Will Myers and Eric Hosmer. Uh, I question uh, their pitching development because of uh, Larry Rothschild. And um, I don't know. I just I, I'm not a huge fan of this move. Like not even just because I wanted Musgrove, but like in terms of for the Padres, it didn't really make all the sense in the world. It just felt like a trade out of the blue, and no one saw this coming. And that's for good reason because they had much more pressing issues in the bullpen. Like Rosenthal, one of their best relievers last year, they acquired at the deadline. He's a free agent. They just lost the eights. They have young arms, um, and I think like a guy like a Colin Posh is going to bounce. Is can be bounce can be able to bounce back, um, but. I, I, it just felt like a really weird trade. I, Musgrove's a good pitcher, but it's it didn't really make sense for them at all. Yeah, I agree with you on that front. I I think our opinions are pretty similar. At least, I mean, Pittsburgh got a pretty good haul of prospects. They got five prospects in that deal. They essentially traded Cole for Musgrove for five prospects, and they're probably going to be able to flip Charlie uh, Colin Moran at some point. So. Ah, they, they, you know, pirates are doing what they got to do. They're finally just tearing it down. I like the pitching coaches they have over there. They actually, uh, the, when they fired, um, Searage, they were able to turn Musgrove around. So I like what they're, what they're building over there. Another moving part of the Joe Musgrove move was Joey Lucchese being sent to the New York Mets. Uh, they were, they gave up a very low level prospect, not very low, but they gave up a low level prospect, um, to Pittsburgh in this deal to get Lucchese from the Padres. So, uh, at this point, Lucchese projects is pretty much their five starter or six starter or another solid bullpen arm, depending on how the Mets intend on using him, which is rather unclear at this point. Uh, Ryan, what are your initial thoughts on this move? I mean, for the Mets, I think this is a pretty good move. I mean, you increase you increase the amount of arms you have for that rotation. Uh, Lucchese is a pretty solid starting pitcher, and he is young, controllable, all these things. Um, from 2018 to 2019, he had 9.29 strikeouts per nine. The issue was just the home run ball, but I, I mean, that's, that was from a, a 16.5% home runs to fly ball rate, uh, percentage. So overall, I think it's a good move. You get a solid starting pitcher. He's again, nothing crazy, but he's solid. And at that point, if you're getting your five until, um, Syndergaard comes back and you kind of have him battle it out with Peterson, he replaces the, uh, Steven Max net rotation and Matt's, I think has good stuff, but, He's not – he's clearly something's wrong with him in the rotation. So he, he this is a good move, and they didn't give up much to get him. I think it was just a number 14 prospect, and they don't have a good farm system. So overall, a pretty good move. Yeah, I would have to agree with you. I think it was a pretty solid move. Um, uh, there's really not much to say, like I said. Uh, solid move. They didn't give up much. It's a very low-risk, high-reward type situation. Uh, if Lucchese can repeat his 2018 season or come close to it, they must be incredibly happy with what they got. Yeah. Moving on to a couple other minor moves. The uh, Red Sox signed Enrique Hernandez to a two-year, $14 million contract. Uh, now, one of our producers uh, who's on the call currently is Jackson Del Rosario. D- Del Rosario. He's a diehard Red Sox fan. And I have to say, this is a pretty shitty move. Uh, it's really not worth $7 million a year, in my opinion, at this point. Uh, with the COVID market, I-, I just don't think he's really worth that. I think there are a couple other guys who the Red Sox have gone after. Now, at this point, the Red Sox lineup is incredibly thin because they're not a very good team uh, to the point where they'll probably be starting Hernandez at second base regularly. Uh, who's their other option? Do you, Ryan, do you know the other option? for? I think uh, it's the Red that – uh, oh, how am I forgetting? Is it Aruz or is he the short – no, he's oh, – yeah, No, yeah. it is Aruz. It is Aruz. I forgot, it. I forgot who it was. He's pretty irrelevant like the team. So oh, no. uh, <laughs> I, I just say uh, it, I guess it's an okay move. I think with Stella would have been much better for them. I think uh, Bloom doesn't know what he's doing, so I won't Whoa. question it too much. Uh, I think he doesn't know what he's doing. So, Hernandez, it's okay. I'm not a huge fan of it. Ryan, what are your thoughts? Uh, I was going to say it was a pretty good move if you think about it because it's $7 million for a guy who can play literally every single position not named catcher. I, he, I mean – at the worst case scenario, worst case scenario, you've burned seven million dollars. The Boston Red Sox are not a small market team, so like they're completely fine with burning seven million dollars. And at so either he's one mediocre, and he's just on the team giving them uh, innings and the lineup, and at bats in the lineup, or B he's pretty good and Bloom flips him for players because he's got a really affordable contract and plays every single position. 
if you look at what Profar got, I, yeah. Profar not only got another year, despite the fact that he's a bad defender, even though he's versatile, he's a bad defender. TK is an average defender at some positions, good at some, not great at all. But um, he's basically a solid defender who plays every single position. So I think he's much more valuable uh, than a guy like um, than a guy like like Profar. And Profar got an extra year. They waited it out in the market because they clearly wanted Profar, and they only got him for two years, fourteen million. It's a good signing, in my opinion. I I don't like pro. I didn't like the Profar move, and we'll get into the Profar move in a second. I more comparing this to a guy like Pamela Estela, who I think is a tier or two better than Hernandez at this point, and. At the end of the day, versatility matters, but I mean, like, like, put it this way, I, I would rather have someone like Listella, who's going to be playing second base every day, who's going to be better, um, and who'd probably be, le- I mean, he's going to be less, he's pretty, pretty similar contract, I would I would bet, maybe he's one year deal, maybe it's two years, I don't know, either way, I think is better, Listella could still play all the infield spots, um, besides we could play first, second, and third base, so at the end of the day, uh, I'm not too much, of, uh, I'm not a big fan of this, and same with the pro, pro bar standing. Uh, talk about the Profar signing just a bit. The San Diego Padres made another move. They signed Pearson Profar to a three-year, $20 million, uh, $21 million contract. Same average annual value as Hernandez, but he gets an extra year. Pretty similar to Hernandez. He can play every position but catcher and pitcher. Uh, as Ryan alluded to before, he's not a very good defender, and I'm going to have to agree with him on that. I'd say he's a slightly better hitter than Hernandez yes, yeah. going forward, though they'd be pretty similar, I'd say, in that regard. And uh, at the end of the day, I don't like either really I don't really like either signing. I guess the profile signing makes a bit more sense just because they're already set at second base with um Kim and they're already pretty much set in left field with potentially Fam and Cronenworth. I'm not entirely sure where Fam is going to play given that Cronenworth is uh supposedly the starting left fielder. And you have Will Myers who was really good last year in right. I would suspect Profar plays a bit of every position. Um, I think first base Loki might be the better spot for him, given that Eric Hosmer is just dog shit. Like, if you're a Padres fan listening to this, I don't know how many listeners we'll have for our first podcast. Eric Hosmer is not good. He's on one of the worst contracts in baseball. He's not a top 10 first baseman, and you know who I'm talking about who said that. He's not. He's not good. I like so, I, I would I would think that if, if Hosmer, I'm sorry, not Hosmer, if um, Provar's going to play anywhere on a regular basis, it would probably be first base because he can play there. Uh, but like I said, not a big fan of the move. So Ryan, I know you already gave a few of your thoughts already when we're talking about, uh, Hernandez, but what are your thoughts on the deal? Uh, on the Hernandez and Profar deal? I mean, I agree with you on their uh, Profar deal a little bit because I, I just felt like it was a really weird signing. I mean, for you bring up Listello, but uh, and I agree, Listello would have obviously been a better option for both teams. But I don't like. I think that's a matter of just like maybe Listello is just not interested in going to either city or something like that. Because I would believe that they would be interested in both players if they uh, like. I don't see the Reds like Bloom is not is not going to say. Oh, uh, I looked at Enrique Hernandez's numbers and said he's better than Tommy LaStella. I think it was probably just a matter of Tommy LaStella might not want to go there or he's asking for more than we think. We don't know. Uh, so that's just my thoughts on it. Yeah, well, I was talking with LaStella. I understand the Padres not wanting LaStella just because uh, relative to Profar, he doesn't have too much position, uh, util- utility position in the outfield. I think Pro- I think LaStella would have made a great first baseman for them, though – you're probably not going to play Eric Hosmer, who's making over $20 million a year for the next three years on the bench. Though I would, I mean, he's kind of bad, like I was alluding to before. He's, he's pretty bad. So um, at the end of the day, I think both signings are pretty similar in the regards that they're not great. I think they're slight, slight overpays, and there are much better options on the market. Moving on, we have uh, former uh, Angels and Twins and Padres catcher Jason Castro returning back to Houston, where he started his career. I think this is a great move for Houston. Castro, in my opinion, is a pretty much top 20 catcher, maybe top 15. I forgot exactly where I put him in my rankings. He's a solid hitter. He's a good defender. He's, I don't know, there's, there's not really much else to say. Uh, if he can return to his 2016 form, I think the Astros would be more than pleased. Even last year, uh, per expected weighted on base average, which is not the be-all, end-all stat, is. he was above average enough, no, Fuck X will be waiting on base average. Stop it. Never. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Either way, I think it was a pretty good signing, uh, given that it was pretty cheap as well. 
Uh, and that's pretty much all I have to say about that. Ryan, what are your thoughts? Uh, for me, I agree. I, I like the K Jason Castro signing just because, I mean, even if he can't hit, he's a good framer. And I'm pretty sure they still have Mal Do they, they still do have Maldonado, I believe. Because I know he tweeted. They do have Maldonado. Yeah. So then they have him and Maldonado. And so, you know, Castro can either be coming off the bench and he's a good framer. You know, he faces right-handed pitching only. That never comes off the bench for lefties. Uh, or never starts during uh, against lefties. Because I'm pretty sure he's a good, uh, solid hitter enough against righties. And most catchers can't hit. He is. So if he gives you like a 95 weighted runs creative plus because you only play him against righties and he's got that good framing, uh, it's a great signing. And what was it like? I think he's, I think he's getting paid like $6 million over the next two years. Six million total, maybe. Yeah, yep. it's it's super cheap. It's I mean, I was, I was a, uh, I I was wondering how he did, if it was three million. Now I'm wondering how other teams didn't jump on that because for three million, it's a it's. I mean, the Cubs signed Romine for I think one year two million. You would think Castro would serve their needs much more, considering Contreras hasn't been a very good framer in his career, and he's left handed, and Contreras is right handed, so. I mean, if Romine got one year, two million, and Castro got two years, six million, the Astros are just continuing to show why, outside of the whole cheating thing, when it comes to player acquisition, they're a model organization. At the end of the day, also, Castro, uh, I think a, an ideal platoon situation is a Maldonado versus the lefties, Castro versus righties. As Jason Castro in 2019 versus right handed pitching he had a 123 weighted runs created plus with a 12.2 uh, walk percentage. He strikes out quite a bit, but I don't really give a flying fuck about strikeouts in the yeah, game. So it's fine in that. It's it's fine in that regard. He's pretty inconsistent throughout his career. I'm looking at his numbers right now. 2012 and 2013, he was amazing versus righties. In 2013, he had a 136 WRC plus against righties. Like I said, though, he's definitely significantly better against right-handed pitching, and that's who he should be playing against. He really shouldn't be starting against left-handed pitching. That probably should be Maldonado. Like you were alluding to, he's a good framer. Uh, I think this is an incredibly Solid signing for the Astros, model organization, even the cheating. It was well executed at the time. Uh, if Mike Fires went to the snitch, they would have gotten away with it. So, um, but don't cheat. Cheating's no, not that's good. good. I'm, I'm just saying. Not at the end of the day. <laughs> yeah. I, any, anyways, uh, good signing. Not too much to it besides the good signing, good depth piece, good potential starting piece, platoon. Uh, our last minor signing that's happened recently is Jose Quintana to Los Angeles. Uh, more specifically, Anaheim. I think this is a good signing. The Angels lack starting pitching. Uh, Quintana was incredible until he got to the Cubs when he became pretty mediocre. Shout out to the Cubs for uh, not ruining pitchers, but making Let's them worse. Go Cubs. Um, go Cubs, go. Um, <laughs> go Cubs, go. <laughs> that is also... That is also a uh, producer, one of our producers, uh, James Valentinez, who is a Cubs fan. He's not biased at all, but... He's incredibly biased at the end of the day. Uh, so don't listen to what he's say. Uh, Quintana, good signing. Uh, good probably four or five starter for the Angels. They'll likely get Bauer at this point. I think it's between them and the White Sox. Ryan, what are your thoughts? Um, look, if as long as the Angels get another starting pitcher, this is good. Like, this, I think this move is basically like, if this is the only starting pitcher they get, they get then a lot of fa Angels fans will be disappointed. But if he's a signing you make, after uh before you get a guy like a bauer or you execute a trade for a starting pitcher i think it's a fantastic uh signing because it's eight million dollars for a guy who before 2020 when he had like that freak accident with the washing dishes where he's cut his nerve on a finger he's been a very durable starter uh 4.36 era 4.09 fip is you know it's 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 run of the mill uh it's he's not going to be crazy, uh, but I'm pretty sure Los Angeles uh, with the Angels that stadium. I don't I don't know if it's pitcher friendly or not. I'm pretty sure it's uh, pitcher friendly. Not 100 percent sure. I have to check. Um, but hey, he's going to be able to just be a solid starter for eight million dollars, and it doesn't hurt the Angels. They they're not going to be like dying at paying eight million for a one year contract, and they need pitching because they have absolutely just a god awful rotation. And anything that can help Mike Trout maybe is something I'm all on board for. Moving on to our next uh, segment of our podcast, we have uh, a candidate that should be traded uh, from whatever team it really is. The only requirement is they should be traded for the interest of one team or the other. My uh, candidate is going to be Rockies pitcher Herman Marquez. At this point, Marquez's love, uh, value is pretty high. Um, the real knock with Marquez is – that uh, he, he's pitching in Coors Field that his ERA is a bit inflated. But at the end of the day, the only general managers that really care about that are the Rockies, and he has them because they're so uh, – and maybe the Cardinals because they're also fucking trash in the front office. So I'll say Herman Marquez is a guy – I doubt he gets traded just because 
Jeff Burdrich is pretty a, a pretty bad GM at the end of the day. But I'll say two candidates or two teams that should definitely go after Herman Mar- Mar- Marquez are the Los Angeles Angels and the Toronto Blue Jays. For the Blue Jays, we've already discussed in this podcast, they need pitching desperately. They have plenty of assets to do it. Someone like Orvelis Martinez is a guy that can go back to the Rockies. Uh, I don't think they trade any of their top guys. I don't think they trade Pearson. I don't think you uh, you trade any of the guys that are in Major League Baseball at the moment. Someone like potentially Alec Manoa, who apparently has problems but doesn't actually have problems. Uh, we don't entirely know the whole situation surrounding that. So Alec Manoa is definitely going to be in their turn. Uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens with Marquez because he's sort of wasting his career at the moment in uh, Coors Field with the Rockies. And actually, if you look at it, Herman Marquez has pretty much been the best Rockies pitcher in franchise history. Like, there's really nobody else just because they've had a pretty lackluster um, franchise history. Ubaldo with Sony might challenge you for that. As for the – Jimenez? Ubaldo? Yeah. Ubaldo? Yeah, Jimenez. I know what you're talking about. I, I think it's definitely – you could definitely make that argument. But I'd yeah. probably go with Marquez off the top of my head. Uh, the Angels at this point need him uh, pretty badly. They need another starting pitcher, whether it's Bauer, who I don't think you should go after because he's going to get massively overpaid. Uh, I think Marquez is definitely the guy you want for the Angels. This package probably centers around Brandon Marsh, who's their number one prospect, but the Angels have an incredibly weak farm system. So um, someone like Brandon Marsh to be in the deal, uh, I don't know what other assets they'd add. They probably would try to finesse a reliever from the Rockies as well. Maybe a Scott Oberg. I don't really know who they have off the top of my head. Uh, who they'd probably trade just because their bullpen is also one of the worst in baseball. The Rockies yeah. are such a poorly run organization. It's actually pretty sad to watch Trevor Story waste his career there. Uh, I'd say it's sad to watch Nolan Arenado race his career there, but he's making a massive bag and he's going to be overpaid. So uh, shout out to him. Uh, as for Marquez in general, I'll just I'll just say that he's one of the better pitchers that could, could potentially be moved. One of the better pitchers on the market. And uh, that's pretty much all there is to it. So, Ryan, who is your candidate that should be traded? So, I think uh, my why? candidate, he's nowhere near as good as Herman Marquez, but um, he is more likely to be traded, and that's Jameson Tyone. And I think the, the first fit for him uh, is the New York Yankees because they don't have the money to be trying to – Guy like um, a Kyle Hendricks, who's gonna who's gonna have thirteen point nine million tagged onto his name in twenty twenty one, and Travis and Town's gonna make two point three million. His stats are pretty good: three seven five ERA, three five one FIP, three seven four XFIP, a four zero one Sierra since uh, twenty seventeen. He didn't pitch in twenty twenty because of Tommy John, uh, which is why his value is as low as it is. And the Yankees could probably throw in Yajure, Esteban Floreal, and like a, another like smaller pitcher and get him. Uh, and then the other two, I think. Albert Abreu, oh, Albert Abreu, yeah, because he's on the roster, so they would, yeah, no, they would have to move him. He's on the forty man. Mm-hmm. Um, I think a, another team that can make a push for him, and I think that this is a team that that I don't, I don't, I don't hear a lot of talks with Tyon with them, but I think it would be perfect for that team. Uh, the White Sox, they have a young team. You put Tyon in that rotation. You have Giolito, Lynn, Tyon, Keuchel, and then your last spot is the best of your young pitchers. Um, they don't have to give up much to get him. Again, they're also a team that's probably not trying to spend too much money on another pitcher. Um, so you go out and you add him at 2.3 million is what his arbitration was. Uh, you go out, give a couple assets for him and you now have a pretty good rotation. And at that point, when you have that rotation, not only are you stealing that piece from the Yankees, but you're now getting better and you could put yourself in a position where you can try to knock off the Yankees or the Astros or the Rays for that AL crown. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you in terms of the uh, White Sox team, the rotation help. Lance Lynn's pretty mediocre. Um, I, you know what? I'll, I'll get, I'll, I'll address the elephant in the room or the call here. I fucking oh, despise the White Sox. I hate that Fuck team the White so Sox. much. Fuck the, I, I fucking hate the White Sox. The only reason is why their fan base is so fucking <laughs> annoying. It is incessantly like they over. I understand teams overrate their players. I understand. I, I believe me, I do. I'm a Yankees fan. I live with our fan base. But the White Sox fan base, not only do they overrate their players, they give no – there's, like, no logic to it. Guys like like Tim Anderson, I understand. He's, like, a good batting average. I, I'm probably higher on him than the majority of people in this call at the moment. But I, it's uh, – Jose Abreu, dude, 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 I could go for – date. I could do an entire podcast on why I hate the White Sox. Uh, and maybe we'll do that at some point if you guys want to see that. Uh, no. we I, I, I have no problem with that. I, I would do that. No, I could go. I could go an hour about why I fucking despise the White Sox, but uh, I, I do agree with you. I think Tyler would be a great fit there. 
Same with the Yankees. Uh, I think the Yankees are probably more of a logistical um, option just because they're probably willing to give a better package uh, because they desperately need somebody who's going to fit under that luxury tax. So I agree with you with Tyon. All right, so oh, let's sure, talk sure. about the most underrated free agent, easily the most underrated one, and that is my boy, Andrew Chafin. 3171 ERA, 312 FIP, 349 XFIP, a 3.57 skill interactive ERA, and a 17.9% strikeout to walk percentage. Is he the best reliever on the market? No. But is he the most underrated one? Yes. I guarantee you zero people have talked about Andrew Chafin. Like, I, if he walked by you on the streets, even if you're the most diehard baseball fan, you would not know who he is. If he picked you up in a cab or, like, on the bus, you would just tip him or something or give him your Metro card or bus pass or whatever like you literally would have no clue who he is and he's one of the better relievers on the market easily easily the most underrated player on this market see ryan i'm gonna have to disagree with you here uh i think the clear most underrated player on this market is also a reliever by the name of keone kela uh kela kela i don't know how to pronounce your name i'm sorry if you're watching this keone uh kela is one of the more underrated, underrated relievers in baseball as he has been very solid in the past. In his 2018 season, he had a 2.97 uh, FIP and a 3.31 XFIP with a uh, with a 2.99 skilled interactive ERA. The last years have been a bit of a struggle just because, not struggle, they just haven't, haven't been as good as he's only combined uh, for 31 innings. So I think the, the thing with Kayla, the reason why I'm so much higher in Kayla than pretty much Chafin is just because Kayla's potential to be better uh, it comes from his velocity and his potential movement on pitches. I'm not going to, you know, say that. Uh, obviously, we, we both know that Chafin is not – his stuff is not as good as Kella. But at the end of the day, uh, if they're getting roughly the same contract, maybe Kella gets slightly more. Uh, I think he has the potential to be better just uh, for cost-effectiveness purposes. I'm not denying that Chafin's a good pitcher because he is good. But I think the biggest thing with Kela is his ceiling compared to Chafin's, which I think is well. Higher. Again, I agree that you know Kela Kela is probably the better reliever right now. But does anyone does like any like most people have talked about? Hey, you know Kela's an under underrated arm. You know, in fact, there was a he he uh, actually there was if you go on his uh, Instagram, those I, I didn't see this until now actually. Uh, back in November, December, someone comment was commenting under his Instagram. Hey, come to the Red Sox. Hey, come to the Red Sox. He did an article on it because he said, "Yeah, I wouldn't mind playing with Boston." That's like one rumor. That's at least something. Are we sure? Are we sure? That no, it was not. Like, I checked the screenshot. Uh, it was Jackson not Jackson. Jackson. Sorry, yeah. Even though I'm pretty sure Jackson would be pretty happy with getting Keone Kella. Nope, I am sure I am one hundred percent sure he is not. Burners. And on top of that. All right, well, there's one per there's one person we know people have Ooh. talked about Andrew Schaefen before. That's me. You're talking that about Andrew Schaefen right now. Uh Yankees Giant tw- uh, Twitter user, Twitter user and Yankees uh and Instagram user, uh, Yankees uh, Giant uh, Avenue talked about Andrew Schaefen. I talked yeah, about I'm, 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 I will go on I think a lot of people have talked about him. Jack, your tweet, Bro, your tweet the last, three likes the seven, last seven. Tweet the last tweet <laughs> about it. <laughs> like, if you look at that, is not me. It is November exactly because Andrew Chafin is overrated. Oh He's my! Overrated. Oh no! No! no. Okay. Okay, dude. The, you you tweeted it. That's not fair. Okay, look at this. I, it counts. Third, I, I, it I, was it I'm was okay. If you look at the top free agent, uh, left-handed relief pitchers, the MLB executive burner account. That's reporter uh he put him and, and he's he's got a lot of followers he put him as the 12th best one behind jose alvarez Uranis, elias and oliver perez exactly but that's what those casuals are exactly you see, dude look at all the look exactly. there's like two tweets two tweets about him after the uh, after august 31st that isn't me that aren't oh no okay someone just saw, someone just tweeted about Andrew Chafin okay no that, as I was I'm not even kidding someone <laughs> but the more t- people talking about Keone Kella and Andrew Chafin again you know what nerds I I I remember I talked to you about the whole he's gonna have a better skill interactive ERA he's going to have a better skill interactive ERA and not only that nerds not only that but he will be in the playoffs on the NL in the NL he will face the New York Yankees. In the World Series, he will strike out the last batters to win the World Series. That will happen. 
I promise you that. That's all going to happen. You heard it here first. Hey, if this if this happens, I'll be out. Bro, you, you're. I think you might cry already, yourself to sleep worry. if we lose because of Andrew Chafin. I mean, I'll I would too. But I, would, lose in general, I would cry myself to sleep, but I, I wouldn't Chafin, take a bath with a toaster because it was Andrew Chafin. <laughs> All right. Well, I uh, pretty pretty um pretty similar. Yeah. Uh, circumstances though, at the end of the day, as relief pitchers in general tend to be underrated because they're very they're sort of like an upper echelon of relievers and then there's sort of a drop off but they're all very solid all at the end of the day so uh i'll have to say I, I think both of our points are pretty valid and i agree with both of them uh where do you think uh Schaefer would go because i yeah I know you said he's gonna be a dodger so yeah because like i Potters think the dodger's gonna win that now yep he's gonna be a dodger. dodger okay all right i all right i think Kilo's a good fit for potentially the Red Sox, the Yankees. Uh, really, there's really not one team that I can imagine wouldn't want someone I like think the goes for the price too. Is come like out. I think so, both of them are just like why uh, would I? Why like? Yeah. All right, yeah, just I contenders. Suppose, yeah. I'm just said a rebuilding yeah. team, but not contenders. Mm-hmm. Even real, even rebuilding teams at the end of the day could um could, could benefit. Yeah, them because, like, I just find it that crazy way. that Ant, like Zach Britton got. Fourteen million dollars as a club option because, like the the Yankees picked it up, they gave him million dollars, and yep. you could argue Keona Kella is better, and you could make the argument Chafin is better, and those guys are gonna get like combined, like both of their contracts combined will be less than Britain's. As the free agency goes on, and we have a relatively slow off season, though it's been picking up recently with the George Springer signing. Um, another player that is highly touted by plenty of people is Marcelo Zuna. Uh, he was incredibly good last year as he finished top five in MVP voting as a designated hitter for the majority of the year. And he was straight up an elite hitter last year. I think anyone yep. could have predicted his uh, resurgence slash breakout as he was getting incredibly unlucky and really just had to fix some things with his launch angle and pull percentage going forward, which he was able to do, and he clearly benefited uh, mightily from it. Though he only signed a one-year deal, so he is back on the free agent market and it clearly benefited him because at the end of the day, he bet on himself and his value went up immensely. Ryan, where do you think Ozuna is going to go? What do you think the best fit is? And what do you think his contract's going to be? Um, well, I don't know if he signs here. I would think the best fit is the uh, the White Sox because they do the right field position so bad. I think they have an angle out there. Like, it's just not good. And they can really use an offensive weapon like um, a, uh, a uh, Ozuna to put out there. He can't defend. Um, but you can live with that if you're getting the offensive production. Uh, corner outfielders, uh, they or just pl- position players outside of shortstop and catcher, uh, if they're really good offensively, they can be bad defensively, and they're still going to provide a lot of value. But uh, I don't know. I feel like he's going to be probably. I feel like I personally feel like he could be a Dodger just because they have money and they're just uh, they just like making everyone else miserable. So they could. I think that's probably the landing spot. But uh, I think the best fits the White Sox. I. Yeah, I was going to say, they already, they already signed, signed Adam, Adam Eaton. Eaton, so it's unlikely they actually do sign him, but I kind of see what you're saying, because Adam Eaton's kind of trash. A uh, fit for yeah, Marcelo no, no. Zuna? They, have, they, they yeah. still don't have a right fielder, though. Adam Eaton's the right fielder. Mazzara's Mazzara gone, is, I think. Mazzara's Mazzara? gone. Right? He and sucks, too. If he was still there, I would still say sign him Zuna. He sucks. Oh, okay. Okay, yeah, but yeah. Eaton's the right fielder, right? Because right? yeah. Jimenez left. At the, end the day, at the end of the day, then... Oh, God. Yeah, Vaughn, I, I think I, I was gonna say the White Sox could still benefit him from putting him in left field and Eloy DHing because they don't really have a DH. As Edwin Encarnacion's gone, he's probably not going to come back. So the White Sox are the White Sox would be an interesting option with Ozuna. I think another interesting option is the Seattle Mariners. It appears Ooh. that their rebuild is almost going to be complete uh, with top prospects like Julio Rodriguez and Jared Kelenic likely coming up at the end of this year towards to next year. Marshall is going to be an interesting candidate on potentially a three- to four-year deal as he would pretty much fit their window. It would be a pretty similar signing, honestly, to uh, the White Sox sending uh, a guy like Ellis Keuchel, who isn't as good and he's not very good. But at the end of the day, he's going to fit their window in terms of uh, when their prospects are going to come up, and he could be a middle-of-the-order bat for them. Uh, he could DH, he could play the outfield, really. Their outfield's kind of loaded, so he'd probably be more of a DH. Uh, but it was going to be a pretty cool fit there. A couple of other teams have been rumored uh, are the Yankees and Dodgers. 
The Dodgers I could see, but the Yankees is such a I, I really don't understand it at all. And a lot of it is because reporters have been pretty really honestly pretty shitty this year. Ken Rosenthal yeah. has fallen off. Even Jeff Passan got something wrong, which is incredibly uh, rare. You know, almost uh, the whole Brantley debacle, everyone got wrong. So you got to imagine one source or maybe three sources all heard the same thing from the club and or someone around the club or from somebody from Brantley camp. Um, maybe I'm thinking what happened was somebody from Brantley camp leaked the news and it forced the Astros to up their offer because it was being finalized and he wanted to go back to Houston but um, it, they weren't giving him the contract he wanted. So he used it as a bargaining or negotiation a negotiation tactic. But at the end of the day, reporters have been pretty bad this year, especially like the non-verified reporters like Hector Gomez, who yeah. said Luis Castillo, the Yankees, is a done deal because the Yankees thought it would be a done deal. Like, I don't think it, – it's so hard to compre- comprehend that somebody who does it for a living would actually say something along the lines of the Yankees would trade for Luis Castillo, but the Reds wouldn't, so it was done from the Yankees' perspective. Like, you, you understand that. The Yankees would trade fucking Tyler Wade for Luis Castillo, but the Reds obviously wouldn't do that. So it's not a trade. It's not remotely close to a trade. It's not remotely close to an agreement. And the fact that you got reporters out there and people believing them, spreading it around Twitter, uh, saying shit like that, it, it is really counterproductive to the reporting of baseball, which has already been pretty – it's been pretty bad. If we're being honest with each other, uh, baseball reporting has been pretty bad this offseason. It, it, it's never been the greatest, I'd say. NBA reporting has been significantly better. Uh, just because you have those two reliable guys, you have Shams and uh, Woj, and there's also Mark Stein, pretty reliable. So uh, at the end of the day, I, I just think that reporters have to be better at the end of the day. And, and it's not entirely reporters' fault because sources could be wrong, uh, but it, it's on reporters to do better job sort of vetting for potentially multiple sources. Brian, what are your thoughts on the Ozuna potential uh, debacle with the Yankees and the reporters just not being on their game this offseason? Well, I agree. I mean, I think you like, okay, just from a baseball fan standpoint, why would the Yankees not be on the market for like, okay, if the Yankees are going to give a four year deal, because Ozuna wants a four year deal, if the Yankees are going to give a four year deal to Ozuna, you mean to tell me they didn't try to sign Hendricks or sign a starting pitcher? Like, Hendricks would have made more sense for them at the four year deal, would have cost less. And yeah, you're investing more in the bullpen, but it just makes no sense. Like, you just have to be a baseball fan and just understand how rosters work to look at it and say, why would they give another outfielder who's a right handed power hitting? can't play well, great defense in right field. When the Yankees are locked in at DH with Giancarlo Stanton, why would they give him four years? It would be like, what, 80 million probably, something like that? Yep. I, it's just, you have, it, it's so, it's such a dumb, idiotic rumor. He, in, I think the reason that, that a lot of these rumors have been like either faking out the Yankees or um, stuff like that is one, to get the story first, because that gives you credit, uh, or two, using the Yankees, because Yankees Twitter is very active and they're very gullible. Like the enti- all of Yankees Twitter bought Hector Gomez. Like even, or people, it's not even just like Yankee fans being dumb. It's also that they just want to be like, they want it to happen. So of course they're going to try to talk themselves into believing it. I agree with you. Um, that's pretty much all I have to say on the topic. Do you have anything else to say about it? Nah, it's just that, uh, reporters, these reporters are trying to be first and they're baiting people pretty Uh, good at it. More hot stove news as the short stuff market is starting to move. The Reds have expressed interest in shortstop Marcus Semien, a potential reunion with shortstop DD pop up to second base Gregorius and Andrelton Simmons. Ryan, do you think the Reds or the Athletics, who've also been part of these rumors, make a play at any three of these guys? Um, so I think that the Reds end up with Simeon and I think he's a good fit for them because I know he's, I, I, I mean, I, I don't know if he's actually a good defender because his outside of average say one thing, his defensive runs save and UZR say another thing, uh, but he can hit pretty well. Uh, he's a solid hitter. Um, and you know, they don't, they're not, they're really bad to shortstop position. They need whatever they can get. That's a solid shortstop. So I think Simeon's the best bet. They need to avoid Didi Gregorius at all costs. Like, I don't care if it's like blocking him on their phone like, like blocking his agent's number like if that's what it takes i mean yeah dude do, do, do whatever you have to do to remove him from your contact his last full season or not last full season his last the last time we played a 162 which was 2019 he had a negative 14 outs above average in 82 games played in the words of stephen a smith how do you do that like it, like how is it humanly possible to shortstop position and to play their 82 games, like if it's 162, okay, you just had a rough year. 82 games. The dude was on pace to be like the worst defensive shortstop of all time. And also he overperforms his expected weight on base average. But he, let's say he's an above average hitter. He's a second baseman at, at best. 
He's at best the second baseman. I- I'm sorry. I have to agree with you on that front. Uh, I've been on the DD, the anti DD train for a while now. I think he ended up going back to the Phillies uh, because they'll probably miss out on Ram Uto, in my opinion, and be desperate for someone. And they'll go overpay for a guy who isn't very good in DD Glorious. Um, I think the or the Phillies. Yeah, Phillies. Little Phillies. Um, I think we'll uh, you for that. Either way. No, it's Phil Lowell. Oh, yeah, Either yeah, yeah. way. Um, I think the Reds end up with a guy like Mark Simeon. I kind of agree with you. Or Andrews and Simmons. Uh, I definitely think it's going to be either Simmons uh, to the Reds or the Athletics. Um, but I definitely see the the fit with Marcus Semien to the Reds for pretty much exactly the reasons you said. I don't think he's as bad as a defender as his, as what I would say, but he's not as good as a def- as good of a defender as his defensive run saves say. So I think it's more of, as a, a middle ground, and uh, and then you pretty much know where he's a field. I'd say he's around average. I'd say. The Phillies, if they want to show that they're a smart organization, will sign Andrew Elton Simmons. And they're not a smart boys. organization, so they won't. If they want to show yeah, it, I, I agree with you. If they yeah, want to show it, if any team want, the dumbest team will be the out of the three, and I don't think this will be the A's. I think the A's will not be this team because they're not yeah. as stupid. the The smartest organization will end up with with Simeon with Simmons, the one who is just looking for a solid guy is getting Simeon, and the stupidest one is getting Didi. Unless Didi signs last, then I understand that. But if Didi's the first or second one to go, that is the stupidest organization out of the three of them. I agree with you. Moving on to our next segment in the podcast, we have baseball trivia. Uh, our producer, James Valentinus, is going to be delivering the questions to both Ryan and I. The way this works is our easy question, you get one point, our medium question, you get three points, and our hard question or difficult question, you get five points. These will add up uh, throughout the podcast, and uh, I think we'll stop at 20 episodes, and then we'll reset the score after that. So... Uh, the first two, uh, whoever is the most in the 20 episodes is the winner of the trivia for that segment. So uh, take it away, James. All right. So for Ryan's easy question, we've got the Dodgers won the NL pennant in 2017 and 2018. Who was the last NL team to win back-to-back pennants? The before last that? teams win back-to-back NL pennants. Um, that would be... Hmm. Got to think here. Uh, shoot. Would it be the... It, it's not... Is it? Is it the last 20 years or no? I feel yeah, like that's giving, giving away too much. much. Um, is it the last 50 years? Can I, can I ask that? It, it is, right? It has to be. <laughs> That'd be crazy if it wasn't. That'd be crazy yeah. if it wasn't. Uh, shoot. Um, it's, is it the Cardinals? Yeah, I want to steal. No, Jack oh, gone the Braves. What? No, oh, you're both I wrong. completely the forgot about that. Oh, no, I did not wait. Had enough for, oh, I should remember that. Oh, that was such an easy question. I should have had that. Yeah, I don't know why. I didn't well, yeah, because they lost your yeah. injuries. Completely whiffed on that World Series. Okay. Maybe. All right, Jack's easy question. In 2008, Michael Brantley was the player to be named later in a trade he to Cleveland. Back, yeah. Who oh, was he traded so for? This was that was a lob, lob. Okay. Mine, yeah. was, mine was not a lob. I actually, you're, you're that's not easy a lob. I probably wouldn't have known this, but the only reason I do know this is because I did an MLB Nerds looking back post on this actually about a year ago. Go check that out. Instagram yeah. user at MLB Nerds. Okay, I actually like had to think about that. I don't know how you knew that so easy. Okay, uh, Ryan Medium. Which team originally drafted Roger Clemens in 1981? Uh, it wasn't. Was it? No, I don't think it was the Red Sox. Was it the? Uh, was, was it? You know what? No, we'll just go with it. Was it the Red Sox? Damn it! No, it was actually the. Oh wait, I can't say it. Pretty sure it was the Phillies. Uh, Jack, do you want to? Do you want to steal? Oh, uh, no, I thought, no I, way. I knew, You're joking. I knew it was an L team, but I messed that up. They, they get, did they trade him or did he just decline? They drafted him in the 12th oh, round. Oh, okay. You see, that's – okay, that makes sense. All right. Actually, I think this might this question might be easier than I thought. Okay, Ichiro won the MVP and Rookie of the Year in the same season in two thousand one. Who's the only other player to do this to win both awards in the same season? 
Should have been Aaron Judge. It should have been. I have an answer, but I'm not. Well, sure then he wouldn't be the only one, but because of eligibility, can I ask? And if it's not correct, can I get a second shot? Because I'm not sure about eligibility. Mike Trout. Sure. Okay, so yeah, it was that rookie season. He was ineligible. No. So, um, who would it be? I am. Oh, was it uh, was it A Rod? No, I think he won it. Yeah. I think he finished second like the year after, but. Uh, Jeff, so you said last Jeff person Ryan, to win you know. MVP and Rookie of the Year in the same season. In the same season. Oh, sh- uh, besides each hero, um, uh, was it? Was it? Uh, was it? I'm just gonna say, was it Jackie Robinson? Was no, it was a uh, Fred Red Sox. Lynn. Red Sox, right? 19, I remember that. 19, yeah. I sh- actually I knew that in 1975, song. I think. Something like that. Uh, all right. Ryan, hard question. I don't know if you guys are going to know this or not. Uh, which hitter holds the record for most consecutive games with a strikeout? Ooh. Is he an active player? Is it Chris Davis? Yes. Oh, damn it. No. I actually Probably know the name. answer to this one because yeah, he's you know? a Yankee. And why would you do this to us? Okay. Who gives a fly? Nobody cares about strikeouts. Be honest, Aaron Judge. <laughs> Aaron Judge. How do you not know that? Was Ryan? it twenty seventeen? Okay, yes, it is. 30, 30, this, this was... How do you not know that? Yes, because I did. I for I I, I I I like I just didn't think he at, struck out that much. Yeah, but it's okay. I know he struck out a lot. Who cares I just about didn't... strikeouts. They don't matter anyways. Yeah, I don't really care about strikeouts. I got I right. for three. Damn, Jack, your hard questions. Okay. Your your hard questions really hard. I'm sorry. Uh, among all Hall of Fame starting pitchers who de- who debuted post integration, so after nineteen forty seven, who has the worst career ERA? I know. You know? I know this. Um. Oh. Yeah. I, I fucking no idea. No idea. And this is only for starting pitchers. I'm forfeiting. No, I have no idea. <laughs> you want to take a guess? Is it Jack Morris? What? Let's go. Yeah, yes, it is. I know that it was solid. He was solid, yeah, but uh, I know, um, I know he's overrated. He's well, overrated. He's, that's what I yeah, that's, he's not better than Andy Pettit nor David Cohn. His, his, his career. Yeah, he wasn't better than David Cohn. And he got into the Hall of Fame and not David Cohn, and that bothers me. I remember I told my, I got, I got into right, so, with that on on Instagram, and I ran to my dad about that. Okay, so. At the end of our first round of <laughs> trivia, we do have a score of six to five. Uh, Jack is in the lead. After he got, they both stole each other's hard questions, but he got his easy question. I don't know how Ryan missed his, uh-huh, but we're going to laugh at him for that. Moving on to our last segment of today's podcast, we're going to move on to Twitter ratios of the week. If you don't know what a Twitter ratio is, it is when there are actually a couple types of ratios. One is if you reply to a tweet or you quote the tweet and you get more likes than the original tweet. Or there's a cumulative ratio where uh, there are just more comments and likes on a given tweet. Uh, my my ratio of the yep. week w- uh, was when I ratioed Trevor Bauer. Uh, I found one of his old tweets, uh, political tweets, that I didn't necessarily agree with. And I told him to shut the fuck up with Bernie meme. And it was a ratio. I think it was a uh, like 29 to 7 ratio. So that was my ratio <laughs> of the week. Ryan, what was yours? Uh, so this was bit on the MLB post. I don't know if you guys saw the one where it was like, who's the better shortstop city? Is it uh, Chicago or New York? Uh, and some idiot said Chicago. Uh, so I ha- And he said something like, oh, uh, when, uh, uh, when's the last time New York seen a title? And I was like, when's the last time a New York team went fi- – a New York baseball team went 50 years without a ring, which was 26 likes? Then he goes, I'm talking about their droughts they're currently on, which he got five likes on. And I hit him with the uh, – and I quote – yeah, yeah, shut up, buddy. Catch a ratio with 49 likes, giving him 45, a 49 to 5 ratio, which I think is pretty deadly and pretty ice cold. Uh, so, I'd say your you know. ratio is better than mine, but mine was ratioing Trevor Bauer. Yeah. Guys, I think, you know. But that's not an old tweet. That was on, like, what, yeah, 2016? 2016? That's an old tweet. That's not as impressive. And also, everyone was trying to ratio him. Like, I, <laughs> I bodied this, man. Like, this, that's like a body. <laughs> I got, I got, I don't know. I, got, I don't know. I, I wouldn't show up on social media after that one, especially if like, he's a Bulls and White Sox fan. Like he wasn't born during the Jordan era. Like I would just not be a sport. Like I, that's so much pain and suffering. During the first episode of our podcast, if you liked it, leave a like rating on Spotify and, and Apple now, Music. Okay. Uh, go visit our podcast page. Link is in the description. 
Um, I pride myself in thinking of myself as a man of faith, as there is a drive in a deep left field, and we're gone. 